Let me pose a question to you. How many times has a U.S. fighter fired a beyond visual range missile at another combat jet in the past 20 years? Was it 100? 50? 10? The answer is once. A U.S. AIM-120 AMRAAM brought down a Syrian Sukhoi-22 in 2017. This answer brings up another question. If they only ever fired one live radar-guided missile across all the services at a real target, how can they ever get good at beyond visual range combat? Firing at a practice drone that can't shoot back doesn't truly prepare a pilot for real combat. So they need something more. A realistic exercise like Red Flag does a lot to train a pilot, but only a small percentage of U.S. fighter pilots get to attend each year. Even in Red Flag, they don't fire live missiles at each other. It's all simulated. So what about simulating it all in a computer? A lot of people say that sim training isn't useful because it doesn't replicate the real world accurately. But the need for useful BVR training is still there. So the U.S. Air Force commissioned a study to find out the real answer to this question. So what did that study find out? In this video, we'll look at the Air Force's report and answer that question. So let's dive in. Simulators have been used by the U.S. Air Force for decades for training operating procedures and to teach air crews to use complex aircraft systems. But not so much for other areas of aviation. This is because modeling everything that pilots encounter in the air is really hard. Like physical phenomena such as G-forces that fighter pilots use to gauge how hard they're turning in a dogfight. So it's understandable that there is some reluctance to use a sim for combat training. Going with purely real-world training meant that new fighter pilots could take two or more years to get a good understanding of fighting in BVR. This was due to the immense amount of training hours required in the air to become a fully qualified fighter pilot. A new fighter pilot just out of initial F-16 qualification would have approximately 80 hours in the aircraft divided among basic operations, air-to-ground, and air-to-air. -air. That left barely enough time to master all the tasks of beyond visual range combat. To be useful in BVR, a wingman must understand the game plan and remember his role from the mission briefing, aim his radar as directed, locate the group of enemy aircraft and his target within the group, all while using correct and timely communication and following the rules of engagement. If that wingman couldn't do all that in a timely manner, then the fighters would get too close to the enemy and risk being shot down. With all the other mandatory training flights required for proficiency, it could take two or more years before a fighter pilot got enough training sorties in to be useful in BVR. So the Air Force was left with a significant challenge in finding a way to speed up this process. When I first joined the U.S. Air Force, this was the prevailing thought. Pilots trained for combat in rail planes, and that was it. Modeling real-world air warfare in a computer was still in its infancy, and it's something I was privileged to be able to work on during my time in the Air Force. But things changed in January 2002 when the Air Force Research Lab in Mesa, Arizona began a project to find the better way to track pilot performance in BVR combat. And being the Air Force, they had to give it a long-winded name that didn't really describe how cool it actually was. The entire report will be linked in the description, but we'll go over the main points and the report's findings in this video. This experiment was centered on a new piece of software known as the Performance Effectiveness Evaluation Tracking System, or PETS for short. And it would run on a set of simulation stations that look like this. The researchers claimed PETS would collect up to 1 million data points per minute while pilots flew in simulated combat. All of this data is great, but what they really needed was to find a good set of metrics for tracking BVR training performance. And like good scientists, they started with the benchmark. For this benchmark, they used teams consisting of four USAF F-16 pilots. There would also be a group of controllers who would operate a high-fidelity AWACS simulator in a supporting role. When the participants started arriving, they would all fly the same simulated scenario so the researchers could get a baseline score to use for comparison. Then after a solid week of simulator training, they would run a similar scenario again. The researchers could then review the PETS data to see how much performance had changed from the initial benchmark. They would then repeat this with dozens of groups over a two-year period to collect over 55 billion data points for the final report. Here's how that baseline scenario looked. A team of four human fighter pilots would be tasked to defend a ground asset. Two AI strike aircraft would then be sent in to attack that ground asset, 
along with six AI-controlled escort fighters. The strike aircraft were Sukhoi-24 fencers like these, and the escorts were Sukhoi-27 flankers armed with radar-guided AA-10 missiles as well as AA-11 heat-seeking missiles. So the entire enemy package would look like this. Each participating F-16 pilot would have their own simulator station and would be in radio contact with the AWACS crew for support. The scenario would end when one of the following conditions was met. Then pets would show the result for the team's performance. Teams would be able to see the proportion of friendly and enemy assets killed, along with how many strikers reached the target and what their closest range was. Before starting the experiment, the research team collaborated with several fighter pilot subject matter experts to come up with a set of metrics to track performance. This would definitively show if the participants were improving. One of these metrics was a composite score called the Top Gun Summary Outcome Scoring Scheme, which looked like this. You can see by the point weights that the important factor here was preventing the enemy strikers from reaching the target. Even more important was avoiding fratricide. A single friendly fire incident was worth 900 points, which is the equivalent of shooting down all six hostile fighters. That one fratricide would cancel out a solid victory. So that factor had to be tracked so the team could avoid it. Now this wasn't the only metric that was collected. Every time a missile was launched, pets would record some details about it. A missile's effective range goes up with Mach and altitude. G-load decreases performance. So a good test for learning the art of BVR is to see how these numbers change over time for a pilot. Clear Avenue of Fire was measured by seeing if a friendly aircraft was in a narrow cone in front of the launching fighter. If it was inside this cone, then it was in danger of being hit by friendly fire. In this example, the nearest friendly fighter was 17 degrees off the missile's nose, which is just outside the danger cone. This is important because a BVR missile in flight can possibly switch to a nearby target. If that aircraft happens to be an ally, then you just had a fratricide incident and lost 900 points. Another critical area that the researchers looked into is what they called Weapon Engagement Zone Management. The Weapon Engagement Zone, or WES for short, is the heart of BVR combat. Fighter pilots want to get their adversary in the WES while avoiding the enemy's WES. Going into an enemy WES opens up an aircraft to being shot down, so this was an area the researchers wanted to track closely. But in real life, fighter pilots don't train to a WES. Instead, they look for a range that is slightly outside the WES. It's called Minimum Abort Range, or MAR for short. I covered MAR in greater detail in this video, but to recap, it's the range at which a fighter needs to start turning to avoid entering a WES. So whenever one of the fighters entered MAR, the PET software would track how long it spent in there and provide a total time at the end of the scenario. There's another range called Minimum Outrange, which is beyond MAR. At this range, the pilot can turn away from the threat and still have room to recommit to the fight before reaching MAR. Pets also track time in here, too. For both the abort and outranges, pets calculated their values as shown in this graphic. What this means is that those ranges are longest in the front quarter of the target and shortest in the rear quarter. That's simply because a target moving towards the missile is doing some of the work for the missile's motor. This increases the missile's effective range. Conversely, flying away makes it harder to catch the target, so it needs to be launched from a shorter range. If you're interested in learning more, I go into greater detail on what affects a missile's range in this video. This isn't all that pets tracked. It would also note how far apart the shooter and target were when the missile hit. We call this distance F-pole. This number is going to be different than the range between shooter and target at the time of launch, and it can vary wildly depending on post-launch maneuvering. As a fighter pilot gains more experience, this final F-pole distance will increase as a result of practice and feedback. And it definitely should because a pilot wants to stay as far away from the enemy as possible while also making effective shots. So it's a good sign that the training is working if the F-pole goes up. Now there were a lot of other types of data collected by pets, like how well wingmen maintain formation, and there was also data gathered from outside of the software too like how many times the pilots talked over each other on the radio. 
but to keep this video from getting excessively long, I'm going to stop here and move on to how the experiment actually turned out. Here's the summary from the official report. Right at the top, we can see the difference between the Monday benchmark and the final benchmark on Friday is already significant. The number of strike aircraft reaching the target across all the task groups dropped by 58%. The closest approach distance to the target also went up by 38%. Here's an example to put that into perspective. Let's say the strikers were getting to within 20 miles of the defended target on average across all the test groups during the initial baseline. A 38% increase means that by the end of the week, they were getting stopped at over 27 miles. But that's not the biggest increase found during the test. Here's the Top Gun Summary Score. This is the composite score showing the overall effectiveness of the team, including things like enemy aircraft shot down and friendly fire incidents. On average, this score went up by a whopping 314%. But if you look at the scoring table, you can see why. Stopping a striker before it reaches the target triples the score for that striker, so shooting them down early has a disproportionate effect on the final score. And the same could be said for F-16 losses. Fratricide counts for triple the loss in points as an enemy kill, so just by ensuring a clear avenue of fire, the team would dramatically increase their score. But that wasn't all. The range at the time of missile launch also increased by over 10%. And this is due to a combination of increases in speed, altitude, and loft angle. Remember, all of these factors increase the size of a WES. The participants were learning as they went along, and it really shows here. The pilots all got better at managing range to the enemy. Here we see that the average time spent within minimum abort range decreased by over 55%. This means the pilots were much more aware of the enemy's weapon range after a week of training in the sim. And take a look at that average F pole. That increased by 8% as well, so they got better at building that safety buffer after missile launch. When you take into account that the participants in the test were all qualified fighter pilots, and in many cases were also instructors and weapons school graduates, it's really impressive to see that they improved so much. These are all people that know what they're doing already, and even then, they still learn something from the sim. And this is an important point to remember. The research team didn't set out to prove the viability of sim training. They were just after a set of metrics to use for measuring performance. But the results were hard to ignore, and today, sims form the basis of combat training events like Virtual Flag. This research also showed how important the learning was to new pilots. What they found in the study was that this type of training resulted in skill level enhancements that would normally take two or three years to develop. After one week of training, these inexperienced pilots were able to fulfill their responsibilities within the flight for basic and advanced scenarios. Now you might be wondering why did one week of training in a sim do so much more than real-world training? Well, it's not because simulators offer something real life doesn't. It's about what simulators don't have. The cost. Training flights take a lot of time to prep. Air crews need to plan and brief all aspects of the flight, not just the part where BVR training happens. And ground crews need to prepare the plane, including loading it with fuel and mission equipment, all of which takes hours to accomplish. In addition, air crews have mandated crew rest between flights, which typically limits missions to about once per day. But you can skip all of that in a sim and just go straight to the part you want to practice. So in a five-day work week of sim training, a pilot can do dozens of missions. The research participants were doing upwards of 48 engagements plus the benchmarks in that five-day work week. In real aircraft, that would be limited to just five flights and at considerably greater costs in both fuel and man hours. So I think the researchers that created PETS got what they were after. They found metrics that can be used to measure how effective that training was, both in and out of the sim. So, do you think this kind of a system would help you if you wanted to learn BVR? Do you think you could do as well as these Air Force pilots? If you answered yes, then you should come back for the next video in this series. I recreated this exact scenario and the software that measures performance within DCS. In that video, I'll explain how you can use it to track your progress just like pets did, and then you can see if your performance improves too. I hope you'll come back for that video, and thanks for watching.